my name is Colleen and I am an academic detailing pharmacist uh, in Island Health. For those who are not familiar with the academic detailing program, uh, there are 12 pharmacists in British Columbia. We're divided among the different health authorities and essentially what we do is we review the information and evidence on different pharmacotherapy topics and then provide education to various health professionals on those topics. So I meet with family doctors at their office to discuss uh, some of our past topics have been the glucose lowering medications for type 2 diabetes and proton pump inhibitors and things like that. Uh, for the topic that I'm here to discuss today, uh, we partnered with Dr. Blondell Hill and the Bugs and Drugs group and kind of ventured into long-term care. So normally we meet with uh, just prescribers, uh, but for, for this topic, we've been meeting with uh, nurses, care aides, and all the different health professionals in long-term care to bring some information forward on asymptomatic bacteria and UTIs. Uh, so I don't have any relationships with any pharmacy industry. Uh, all the information I discuss is really just trying to bring the evidence forward to clinicians. I work for Island Health and the PAD service is funded by the Ministry of Health. Uh, so as I mentioned, we partnered, partnered with Dr. Blondell Hill and Do Bugs Need Drugs? And why this topic was pursued is because our antibiotic prescription rates in long-term care are a lot higher when we compare those to other international standards. Uh, so when asked clinicians in long-term care, what do you see the most common use of antibiotics? And it has come back as UTIs being the most common, and Dr. Hammond mentioned that even in other studies that it's been shown to be one of the most common diagnoses in our long-term care population. And where we think about UTIs, there also needs to be thought about asymptomatic bacteria. So bringing both uh, forward to, to health professionals. Uh, and so the objectives for today, I'm going to talk about asymptomatic bacteria, uh, just a brief kind of overview, just so everyone's on the same page. And then going into a little bit about urinalyses, when they're useful, when they're not, uh, and a little bit about antibiotics uh, for treatment of complicated cystitis. So anecdotally, I've been to a bunch of different residential care facilities speaking with various health professionals on this topic. And I'd say probably about 75% have never heard of the term of asymptomatic bacteria, didn't know that this existed. Uh, so uh, it's been uh, quite a great learning experience and bringing this information forward. So for a definition, which I'm sure many of you are well aware, uh, there's bacteria in the urine, but there isn't any signs or symptoms of a urinary tract infection. So it is a colonization state. It used to be an old teaching that your urine's sterile, there should never be bacteria there, but there can be bacteria there. There can be bacteria present, just like we have bugs colonized on our skin, we can get bugs colonized in our bladder. It is not an infection, and it does not require treatment with any antibiotics. So any guesses as to how common this is in long-term care? It's very, very common, not quite 90, but uh, for it's something that gets a lot more prevalent as we get older. So women over the age of 65, it's about 20%. And then when we get over 80, it's about 50% for women and 30% for men, longer urethra, so it's harder for them to get colonized. Where the numbers are very large are in those people who have long-term indwelling catheters. They have that constant opening from that outside environment to their bladder. So they're either gonna get the catheter colonized or their bladder colonized, and they almost always have a positive urine test. So that actually leads to kind of one of the first limitations is when we look at urinalyses in isolation without considering what's going on with that patient, the urine test doesn't really tell us a whole lot. If it's positive with lots of leukocytes, nitrates, white blood cells, that could still just be a colonized bug. It could just be asymptomatic bacteria or it could be a urinary tract infection. It doesn't tell us in isolation what's going on with that person. So it's so important to know what are the symptoms that they're experiencing and using that to then get a urine test because it alone, it doesn't really offer all that much. Where it is very useful is that if it is negative, then we know it isn't a urinary tract infection. So the next kind of uh, point has been um, something that has resonated really well uh, in the long-term care facilities that I've gone to. It is a common myth that cloudy or foul-smelling urine is a urinary tract infection. It's something that I even hear when I practice at Victoria General. I hear nurses and uh, care aides say, oh, the urine, it's, it's cloudy, it's foul-smelling, it's a urinary tract infection, we need to get a sample, we need to get that urinalysis sent. 
um, but that is a myth. Um, the as uh, asymptomatic bacteria, when you have bacteria present in the urine, that can cause cloudy and foul smelling urine. So they could just be colonized. So if we act just on what the urine looks like, that can be misleading because the test could come back as positive, but it could just be because somebody's colonized. Um, some of the other reasons why it could be cloudy or foul smelling, dehydration, if they for some reason ate a lot of asparagus uh, or different hygiene things can contribute as well. So not always kind of using that cloudy foul smell urine to be the basis of why we get urine tests. Uh, it might act as a sign, oh, I see this change. I'm then gonna ask the person, are you having any pain? Are you having any other symptoms? So it might act as a prompt to do further investigations, but this alone shouldn't be a, war a reason to get a urine test done. So with all that being said, what's the evidence? Uh, you say I don't need to treat it, but have there been studies done? There have been studies done. Uh, there is a Cochrane review out there, and what the Cochrane review did is they took all these people who were colonized with asymptomatic bacteria, so they weren't having any symptoms, they were just colonized with the bug. They gave half of them antibiotics and the other half placebo, and then they decided to monitor them. Do the people who got the antibiotics, did they do better? Did they get less urosepsis? Did they get less symptomatic UTIs? And the answer was there was actually no difference between the two groups. And for those who got the antibiotics, they obviously had more side effects. <laughs> so antibiotics contribute to C. diff, uh, lots of just general feeling unwell, nausea, diarrhea, lots of drug interactions, they increase antimicrobial resistance. Uh, so there's lots of risks associated with antibiotics. And something that's been being studied with the asymptomatic bacteria, it's mainly been in our younger patient population, so I don't have data for our older patients as of right now, uh, but for younger women who were colonized with asymptomatic bacteria, those women actually had less recurrent UTIs in that that colonized bug in their bladder actually helped keep other invasive bugs out and kind of act as a bit of a protective effect for those women and they had less recurrent UTIs compared to those who weren't colonized. So it's even thought that asymptomatic bacteria might be beneficial for some people. With all that being said, we do treat two different populations. Uh, the first one I would guess you never see in residential care, which is pregnant ladies. Um, and then the other patient population you would treat are people going for major urinary procedures because if you have a colonized bug there and then you cause bleeding and trauma, that bug's gonna move and potentially cause a sepsis. So we do treat and screen in people who are going for major urinary surgeries or prostate resections. All right, moving uh, right along into urinary tract infection uh, symptoms. So this first slide uh, is from, there is a guideline out from Towards Optimized Practice. It is specifically long-term care. And the symptoms here are speaking, I'm speaking mainly to um, more of the cystitis type symptoms uh, when we get into pyelonephritis. Uh, can present a little bit differently. Uh, but when we see people without a catheter and when we're speaking of very specific symptoms, so when I say, say these people without a catheter, when we see these symptoms, then yes, we're thinking UTI. I'm gonna talk about some of the other symptoms because I know in long-term care, they don't present, always present this way. Uh, so I'm gonna allude to some of the other symptoms they see. But when we see these symptoms, these are the ones that we're thinking, okay, yeah, urinary tract infection. So. The main symptom is acute dysuria. So why that is kind of the main symptom we're looking for is that in our older adults, they tend to already have a baseline urgency or frequency. I'm not saying these aren't symptoms. They definitely are symptoms that might get us thinking, especially if it's a change from their baseline. Uh, but it's important to know what is their baseline because that they can just be very common in our older adults. Uh, but burning when you pee is definitely not. So we definitely are thinking that is one of the main symptoms. And then some of the other things, the cost over tubal angle tenderness and the back pain, we're kind of getting into more serious there. Uh, and then fever, which not all of our older adults will present with. Um, where it gets difficult is when patients have a catheter in place. So as I mentioned, almost all the people with a catheter are already colonized. So if we get a urine sample for someone who we think might have a UTI, um, the people with catheter, they don't present with burning when they pee because essentially they have that catheter that's draining their bladder. They don't get those specific 
UTI symptoms. Uh, they get the delirium, they get the fever, uh, so it can be difficult to know what's going on for people with a catheter, and all of them are colonized. So when we get a urine sample, if it's positive, it's not telling us, is this the, the bug that's causing delirium, or is this a colonized bug? There isn't an easy way to be able to tell what's going on for someone, so that's why one of the important steps is to consider the other infections. Question? For delirium and UTIs, there is a, a poor quality uh, systematic review, so the evidence is very poor, uh, but it was about 30% of delirium cases were linked with UTIs and 70% uh, of the cases were associated with something else. So delirium uh, does, it like potentially can be a UTI, but there is also a whole list of other things to consider as well. So we don't have the best quality of evidence, but delirium doesn't equal UTI. There are lots of other things to consider. I mean, a very common scenario for us is uh, an active patient suddenly getting agitated. Mm -hmm. Somebody decides, let's do a urine culture. And yeah. Yeah, exactly. So that is kind of falls under all of these non-specific symptoms. Those behavior changes, a confusion, a delirium. It's one of those things that sometimes these changes are associated with a UTI, but sometimes they're also not. And there are lists of other things that we should be considering. Uh, so uh, just some general ones, uh, dehydration can be contributing. Um, changes in medications is a big one. If we've added something or taken something away, that can cause behavior changes or confusion. Also, uh, pain is another one for behavior changes. So there are lots of different things, other infections, um, low oxygen, low blood sugars in our diabetics. And there are different resources that are being used to try and educate staff about it's been one of those things we always jump to the urine first, but so many people are colonized that that urine can be very misleading. It could comes back positive, but it really might not be the source. So there are lots of things to consider. This acronym, I think is kind of terrible. It's called I Watch Death, but it's all the different things to consider uh, for delirium. What could be causing delirium? And I know um, as, at the Island Health Facilities, the clinical nurse educators have been providing this education to staff. Um, because there are infections is just one piece of the potential puzzle for delirium. Um, so it's one of those things we always want to get find the problem right away and we might be jumping to the urine too quickly uh, because so many people are colonized. Uh, there is another algorithm out there that is from uh, Ontario Public Health and the algorithm's a little nicer. It's for delirium, the algorithm's deliriums. Uh, so thinking like dehydration, drugs, uh, drugs are definitely a big one to consider. And then there's just a whole slew of other things to be considering that could be causing this delirium. And uh, I just have this quote up here because uh, nonspecific symptoms are just that, nonspecific. They can be present in any number of other infections or non-infectious conditions and therefore have low positive predictive value. When we get into this jumping right to this one potential cause, uh, we could be misdiagnosing, we could be forgetting something else. It's common to jump to the urine, but so many people um, are colonized. Um, so just by chance alone, they could have a delirium and be colonized, and we're missing what is the actual cause uh, of the problem here. So with all that being said, I do have two uh, quick little cases just to kind of highlight the points I've discussed so far. So both of them were published in JAMA Internal Medicine and both were published this year. It's been a topic that's gotten a lot of kind of publications as of 2016. Um, so the first one's a little less applicable to long-term care, but the second one is definitely more applicable. Uh, so the first one is a 64-year-old woman. She uh, was on narcotics for back pain and decided, I'm going to stop taking these cold turkey, just stopped her narcotics, which was not a good idea. So she was going through narcotic withdrawal. So she presented to Emerge, and when she was in Emerge, they took a history, they knew exactly why she was there, you're going through narcotic withdrawal, uh, but while she was there, they did a chest x-ray and a urinalysis, just as a kind of standard protocol. Uh, her urinalysis came back with lots of leukocytes, lots of white blood cells, and they were like, oh, by the way, while you're going through this narcotic withdrawal, you also have a UTI, so we're going to treat that. So they gave her antibiotics, she went home. Four days into her seven-day course of antibiotics, 
she started getting severe diarrhea, going more than 10 times a day, spiked a fever, was admitted to hospital with C. diff. So this is a case of where they did this urine screening. She didn't have any symptoms of a UTI, didn't need to get a urine test done, but the urine test was done because she just came into eMERGE trying to figure out what was going on, but they knew it was the narcotic withdrawal uh, and then ended up getting antibiotics when she just had asymptomatic bacteria. The second case is an 85-year-old gentleman from long-term care. He had a chronic indwelling catheter and he's been one to be flagged with, he has recurrent UTIs. So uh, he had just a normal day at the facility and this gentleman started falling. And so they did, they were like, oh, well, there's these new falls, he must have a UTI. Did a urinalysis, came back with a very resistant bug. They actually put him on imipenem to treat this UTI. Seven days later, no change, still falling, nothing had changed for this gentleman. So they actually shipped him off to eMERGE at this point. And uh, when they were in eMERGE, they were viewing the patient and it was found that two days before the falls had started, he had started a medication, Donepazil, which lowered his heart rate and was causing the falls. So he was a catheterized patient. He was gonna grow something anyways when they did the urine test. And it so happened he got seven days of imipenem that he did not need. And we delayed finding out what the actual problem was, which was, this new medication that was added. All right, so transitioning into the antibiotics for treatment. So I'll just reiterating, it's really based on the symptoms, uh, those nonspecific symptoms. Sometimes they are caused by a UTI, but sometimes they're not. So just kind of making sure we review and kind of consider UTI and one of our, one of our last things on, on our list. If someone is really unwell, then yeah, and if they have a pyelonephritis, you may need IV antibiotics and may need to transfer to a different level of care. So the antibiotics I'm going to be talking about are uh, the oral antibiotics for those with just a complicated cystitis. So not really going into that pyelonephritis picture. So our antibiotic options in long-term care uh, are limited. Uh, you're gonna see the choices which may come as a surprise uh, in the next few slides. But really, there's lots of resistance in our older adults just from constant being, constantly being exposed to antibiotics. There's lots of different uropathogens. In our young women, it's almost always E. coli, but as we get older, uh, there's different bugs implicated. And also, I mentioned, they're just considered complicated pictures. So for the uropathogens, E. coli is still the most common, but the second most common is Klebsiella pneumoniae. Um, also, when we think about men, they have different bugs involved, Proteus, Morganella being some of the ones you might consider. And then when people are flagged with having recurrent UTIs or like get a lot of UTIs, um, sometimes it's other gram negatives besides E. coli, and then sometimes we're getting into more of the gram positive bugs as well. So just some of the things to consider, where does uh, your person fall and kind of using this to guide uh, antibiotic selection. Uh, and then I just throw this up here for the complicated cystitis picture, uh, men, immunocompromised, uncontrolled diabetics, people with catheters. Uh, a lot of our older adults in residential care fall under uh, this blanket. All right, so empiric options, amoxicillin clavulanic acid, uh, 875 BID, or you could do the 500 TID as well. Uh, the suffixine, 400 milligrams daily, and septra. Um, so I was wondering, are there any antibiotics that you see a lot and are wondering why they aren't on this list or antibiotics you use a lot in empirically in long-term care? Nitrofurantoin? Nitro Cipro? Macrobid, yeah. All right, so I'm going to talk about Cipro and Macrobid uh, in a second. Um, and so just to let you know, these are in options. So these are options when you don't know what bug you're treating. You always want a narrow therapy when you get your urine culture back or if you wait, guide your therapy based on a urine culture result. Uh, so this is before you know what you're treating. And there are holes in, in therapy. So if you have someone who has recurrent UTIs and you're worried about enterococcus, well, suffixine might not be the best option. So also considering the holes of therapy when you're selecting the therapy empirically, thinking about what is the most common thing that you're gonna see in that adult and long-term care. So, K 
conveniently, what about Cipro? <laughs> so uh, when we look at Island Health antibiograms, we look and we see Cipro, 90%. This is a great option. Why don't I use this? But it's important to think about where this antibiogram data comes from. So who normally gets UTIs? We, there's two spectrums. We have our older adults, and then we have our young women. And so our young women haven't had this constant exposure to antibiotics, so they don't have the same resistance as our older adults. So when we look at data in our older adults compared to our younger adults for Cipro and E. coli, you can see the 20 to, to 40 year olds, it's about 10% resistance of Cipro to E. coli in BC. And then when we look at our older adults, 60 year olds to 70, it's about 25%. 70 to 80, about 30%. When we get to 80 to 89, 40% resistance. And then as we get to 90 over, it's about 50% resistant. So when we think about the resistance rates uh, for Cipro uh, and for E. coli, if we have these older adults, like a third to 50% of the time, it might not be working empirically when we don't have that culture result back. It makes it not the greatest option uh, empirically because of resistance rates. And then, um, as Dr. Hammond uh, referred, there are uh, lots of problems with the fluoroquinolones in general with side effects. Uh, this is actually a recent uh, FDA warning that just came out this past spring uh, regarding fluoroquinolones. And now, this is mainly for uh, if you see younger women uh, for uncomplicated uh, cystitis, really recommending not using ciprofloxacin in this case uh, because of a lot of the serious side effects, the tendon ruptures, the neuropathies, and the CNS effects. Um, so it just kind of makes this class less desirable to be using empirically. We have resistance rates issues and lots of side effects and drug interactions to consider. So it might be something you might need to use because the urine comes back and it's something that you need to use Cipro for, uh, but empirically not something we want to be jumping to first. And what about nitroferentone or macrobid? So macrobid, uh, it's is great for E. coli. It's our first line thing that we recommend, and especially in our young women. Uh, where it has a few limitations in long-term care is that it only gets levels in the bladder. So if there's any thought that there is a, some prostate involvement or if there's any kidney involvement or any kind of systemic involvement, macrobid doesn't really have a role when it's beyond the bladder. So sometimes when we have people with catheter, they're presenting with a delirium. Well, has it already gone a bit further than that bladder if they're on in a full delirious state? Uh, so it kind of can be difficult to know how far or where exactly the infection is in those cases. Um, so it makes it not the greatest option there. Uh, you need good renal function. If, you're, if the creatinine clearance is less than 40, then you can't be using macrobid. Uh, and then it has variable activity. So I mentioned it's great for E. coli. Great, great, great. Klebsiella pneumoniae, which is our second most common bug, not so good. Anywhere between uh, only 30 to 60% uh, of it working. So uh, that can be quite a bit of resistance there. Um, also, it's not good for Proteus and Morganella, which are some of the more common bugs we see in men. Um, so if men, there's any thought to be a prostate component, or it might be some of these other bugs that we see in men, it again makes it not, not a great option. Uh, so there are some limitations. I'm not saying we can never use macrobid in long-term care. It's just one of those things that using it carefully, if we have an older woman and we know it's exactly a cystitis and she doesn't get a lot of them, well then maybe we might consider macrobid in that case. Uh, but when we look at recommendations empirically for everybody in long-term care, macrobid didn't quite make the cut. Uh, and so I just thought I'd throw this up here. You can't, this little thing's covering it. Uh, but Ciprofloxacin and nitroferentoin are the last two here. And when we look at Plan B uh, long-term care facilities uh, and we look at the antibiotic prescription rates, they account for about, those two antibiotics account for about 50% of antibiotics prescribed in long-term care. Uh, so they're being used, used a lot. So I just thought I'd uh, throw that up there. All right. So if we think it's just a lower UTI, then really we only need seven days of therapy. Um, and one of the kind of monitoring perspectives is if you're starting antibiotics and then in 48 hours, your improvement, we need to be thinking, did we pick the wrong antibiotic 
or did we make the wrong diagnosis? Was this someone who had asymptomatic bacteria and then we ended up treating it and there's actually something else going on? So just kind of thinking about that from the monitoring perspective, we should see some kind of change. Uh, and then I have the comment here, long-term prophylaxis this is not recommended. So a once daily antibiotic to prevent UTIs in long-term care is something that's generally not recommended. Um, and especially not using macrobid uh, for this. Uh, macrobid, when used for more than six months, has been linked with some serious lung complications. And I've heard of a few lung transplants in BC due to long-term macrobid use. So something to consider there. It normally, yeah, long-term prophylaxis normally kind of just contributes to resistance and ends up kind of knocking an option out for that person. Uh, I already mentioned the risks of antibiotics, so I won't really spend time there. Uh, and just to let you know, uh, the Towards Optimized Practice Guideline also has an algorithm to try and get um, healthcare staff thinking more about those specific UTI symptoms before getting uh, a urine culture or urinalysis done. Um, and I know uh, Island Health has recently updated their guidelines on UTIs in residential care, trying to, again, focus more on the specifics and getting rid of things like cloudy and foul smelling urine as a UTI. So it's great that we're making some changes there. And also just to let you know, this is a new campaign that launched uh, from the Association of Medical Microbiology Infectious Disease Canada. I see everyone laughing from the title, symptom free pee, let it be. Uh, so it's uh, something that actually just launched uh, November 14th, uh, but just increasing awareness about inappropriate antibiotic use and just considering uh, the different uh, kind of stoplights. If it's if we it's just cloudy urine, don't get any urine tests. Uh, if it's a symptom that's not quite a UTI symptom, let's consider what else it could be. And then if it is specific urine symptoms, then yeah, go ahead with that urinalysis. Uh, I just wanted to mention one thing briefly uh, because one of the challenges that uh, when I've discussed this topic in residential care has been family members. They are the one pushing for getting urine tests. They're the ones that are having a big say in kind of getting certain tests ordered. Uh, so one of the, that can be something that's difficult. If it is one of those scenarios where you're ruling out other things before you go to that urine, just letting that family know you recognize there's a change in their loved one, but you don't want to give antibiotics unless they're absolutely necessary and you are doing other things to make sure you get the right diagnosis um, and educating them that there could be just that asymptomatic bacteria. Uh, a good way to get family involved is if they're spending time with that loved one, getting them to get them hydrated, getting them to nag them, drink that water uh, because Dehydration is a big, is a big problem in long-term care, which contributes to a lot of these symptoms. And also, even if it was a UTI, hydration is important anyways. So uh, it's just one of those good things that if they are concerned, that's a, a way to get them to help and get involved. Uh, just to let you know, there are some uh, handouts available uh, for the treatment of both uncomplicated cystitis and complicated cystitis in long-term care and a handout on asymptomatic bacteria available from bcpad.ca. Uh, and in summation, uh, so our older adults are frequently colonized with bacteria in their urine, can cause cloudy, foul-smelling urine, positive urine tests, but doesn't need to be treated unless they have specific symptoms. Um, so if they have non-specific symptoms, just considering what else it could be. It might be a UTI, but just kind of thinking about what else could be contributing because not all delirium or those non-specific symptoms are UTI. And there are harms with antibiotics, so just considering that before prescribing. And so uh, I open the floor to any questions, but there's also my email address if you do come up with any questions later or if uh, this is something that you're interested in having some education at the site that you work at, I can also come in and discuss this information with other healthcare professionals. Yeah. How does a urinalysis help you if you have symptoms and a positive culture? So if you have specific symptoms of a UTI, then the urinalysis is confirming that it is, uh, and then the urine culture can guide therapy. So that's where the urinalysis is beneficial. It's confirming that you do, okay, yeah, it is a UTI because they have specific UTI symptoms. 
It's just when you look at the urine test alone, it doesn't really offer that much help. And then in our younger women, uh, doing just a dipstick or other things like that and not always pursuing urine cultures is also mm -hmm. something that can be done when it's very specific symptoms. Can I just say, yeah. I think the urinalysis might help you sometimes if the urinalysis is completely naked. So yes. Some patients, that helps tell you, oh, oh it's this not is a UTI. symptomatic bacteriuria, and then you have to go looking for some other cause for the symptom, if the urinalysis has no priority. Yeah. How, how a negative is negative? So is that like zero down the line, down, down the <laughs> rows, like yeah. zero, 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 or you know, we'll accept a little red blood cells, a little leukocytes. Exactly. Yeah, it depends on prior, you know, what they've had in the past and if there's a change. And, um, Two to ten white blood cells. Yeah, oh, it's pretty, no. pretty much okay. yeah. 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 All right. <clears throat> yeah. Um, you're on call. It's Saturday. It's <laughs> you call the average dean. Person's got a catheter, got a temperature of 387. He's a, he's a quadriplegic with, uh, he's about 64. He's caught in Memphis. Do you transfer? <laughs> She's not a doctor. That's not fair. <laughs> we'll, uh, we'll give it to one of the infectious disease guys. What do you guys think? Uh, well, I probably wouldn't if he's just febrile and he's, uh, you know, if he's not, doesn't have signs of SIRS, you know, if his, if his yeah. tachycardia, tachypnea, and fever aren't too bad, and if he's, if his heart rate's high. Yeah, so if he's maintaining fine um, at that time, uh, and his blood pressure's okay, uh, I probably would not transfer him. Uh, you, could, you could start him on an empiric uh, treatment, um, uh, it, you know, uh, it, with an oral beta lactam and see, and see how things go. Um, I think you've got a bit of time on your side. It turned out he had a white count of 30,000 when he was admitted. Oh, yeah. So. <laughs> wow, were you ever hung out to dry there? <laughs> Sorry about that. You need a clinical assessment before, you know, that's no, the song. Yeah, it's okay. Yeah, you know, you, I would, you're not going to send every person who's, you know, febrile to the emergency room. Um, so, uh, and, and I think. Uh, you know, I like the message, you know, you've had two talks and now you're going to see after break a third talk that tells you to use beta lactams as your number one and number two. And, uh, and, and I, I really think, you know, most of the time you have to give it a go uh, with uh, empiric therapy. And that's the thing with UTI. Um, you, um, you're not going to know the answer for two days. Um, so a lot of it there has to do with uh, how is, what's happened to them in the past. And we've all seen those patients where... Uh, they go down fast. Like I've seen some patients, they just have a history of go, going uroseptic and going shocky really quick. And then you look at prior urine cultures mm -hmm. with you know, uh, infections that needed to be treated. And if that patient has an ESBL already documented or a super resistant Morganella or something and they're going to need, need to go to the eMERGE for, for a carbapenem, then, then that's what you're going to have to do. Um, so, so much of it has to do with uh, the history, how they've behaved in the past, what they're already colonized with, and, um, and how they've responded to empiric therapy before. Um, so th these are these are a handful. It's hard to do over the phone. Yeah, I hope you had to go in to see that guy. <laughs> <laughs> I was tempted not to say <laughs> Yeah? So a patient who um, you suspect has a UTI that's refusing meds, a little bit delirious, you know, I, we, we couldn't get anything to her at the time. Um, would you suggest centriaxone, or what would you? Yeah, that gets difficult. I don't know if the ID specialists want to comment on that as well. I am centriaxone is very painful. I guess it would have to come back to what their direct care is. If they're refusing medications, is, do they want to be treated? It can be difficult to, to manage. It might, yeah. Yeah, that's tough. I mean, if you, if you think it's the UTI and she needs antibiotics, uh, I guess you better get some into her own way or another. Another, yeah. Um, if uh, it's something about oral pills, you, there are some liquid formulations. There's uh, phosphomycin. You might be able to trick her with that. Um, Juice. <laughs> other than that, uh, you know, yes, I agree. I think ceftriaxone um, uh, would be a reasonable I am thing to do to maybe, you know, see if she gets better in the after 24 hours of treatment, see if you can switch over to oil and back to that. Uh, uh, I do see people still continue to use gentamicin um, uh, if, for this reason, for injection, and you could consider that too if, uh, if you know, yeah, she didn't have risk factors for that. I would 
think that none of us would treat any of your patients with a full course of genomycin these days, but just to try to get her to turn the corner and, and uh, improve enough to go on a more reasonable, less toxic medication for maybe 48 hours a gen, you could consider that too. If she, if she had no risk factors, you have to be very careful. Yes. Yeah. These patients, she's probably dehydrated, and if you load her up with genomycin, the levels are going to be unpredictable. Toxicity is, is definitely possible, even even with 48 hours of treatment. So, with Gentile, you have to always do kidney function? Well, you should already have an idea of what her kidney function is from before. Uh, and uh, that alone will probably scare you off after time. <laughs> uh, and, then, and, then, and then, yeah, depending on how sick she is now, how sick and dehydrated she is now, you, you probably should have a baseline, a creatinine, before I embark even on 48 hours of jet. Yeah, you're talking about like a single dose. Yeah, so a, sing, a couple doses. You don't need to do yeah. like a, a yeah. single dose. A single dose you could get. Yeah. Well, uh, like, uh, there is a wide spectrum, like asymptomatic spectrum. It's a uh, bacteria, UTI, and there are other variety of UTI, like uh, three kinds of UTI and prostatitis, like a bacterial prostatic infection. So when they will need longer antibiotics, course. So can you touch on that one, please? Uh, about the longer antibiotics for prostatitis. Yeah. Um. I don't know if the so ID yeah, does. Yeah, so prostatitis is, is a big problem. And you, anytime you're dealing with a, a urinary tract infection in the man, you have to consider is there prostate involvement. And, and that's why in you know young women, you can treat uncomplicated cystitis for very short courses. But essentially, never in men can you get away with that because you're always worried about prostate involvement. involvement. So you know when to consider prostate involvement in a male UTI. Um, so if, if they develop Keep new coming. obstructive symptoms, uh, if they have deep pelvic pain, uh, Rectal pain, you can refer these are suggested of acute prostatitis. More in long-term care, what you're going to see is, is worried about chronic prostatitis. And you can you can read ridiculous things like the three-slide test, which I don't think anyone, you know, where you get three samples of urine after prostate massage and all. Really the key in, in an elderly man about, recur, about chronic prostatitis is to keep getting the urinary tract infection with mm -hmm. the same bug over and over and over again. Yeah. You treat them, they get better, and then it's back again. And that's a big warning that you have. Uh, chronic prostatitis, and you're right. In, in those cases, you need to treat them for quite prolonged periods of time, like at least four weeks. And you also need to be really careful about which antibiotics you use. Beta lactams are great UTI drugs in these patients. Beta lactams don't get into the prostate very well, so you do like to reach for Cipro, Septra, tetracyclines. These get into the prostate tissue better. Um, and then you're talking about a four, a six week course, something very prolonged to try and eradicate. Um, so you don't need to treat every man with a urinary tract infection like he has prostatitis, um, but they all need at least two weeks of therapy in a man, and if they're having occurrences or other symptoms um, to suggest prostate involvement, then think about extending that course out. And then you do want to reach for some sort of different drugs just for tissue penetration. Can I make a concept, comment? Just we're talking about the, the catheterized patients. Mm -hmm. I think the key with the catheterized patient is never send any urine right. from the catheter. <laughs> It's utterly and completely useless. Yeah. If you're concerned, they have to swap the Foley and draw from the fresh Foley mm -hmm. catheter yeah. and, and get the urine and get away from the inflammation and the bugs that are on the catheter. Yeah. Um, the, the labs, honestly, should just, if they ever see that it came from a Foley indwelling, just cancel yeah. it because it's always going to have bugs and always going to have inflammation. One of the things we did for a patient of mine who had MS, we basically had a protocol to see if he had urosepsis. You know, every three months. So we ended up doing a protocol where the nurses it was very, very clear how you collected the urine, what you started on prophylactically, you know, and, and just so that he wouldn't end up going to the hospital. He often did, but that we started that. Um, it seemed to work really well because there was some confusion with the nursing staff about what to do with the catheter and how yeah. to collect the urine. <clears throat> Can you comment on phosphomycin then? As, like, yeah. How useful is that? And would you use that or would you use cephalopsin? Um, so phospholmycin is one of those ones, again, where it's only for uncomplicated cystitis. Um, so if it's just bladder involvement, it is a potential option. Um, I know there's been, it's good for, for ESBL, and so we don't want to get into overuse of it. Uh, like, no, we don't want to get into any getting resistance to phospholmycin. Um, but in the uncomplicated cystitis picture where it's just the bladder, it is a potential 
a potential option um, using it. I've seen the family doctors and they've been, some, some of them have been using it. Uh, so where it can be a bit more complicated in our older adults, it's not one of the ones that are kind of recommended empirically just because we have to be very sure it's just the bladder for the phospholipid. Yeah. 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 I'd say, um, you know, here in Victoria, so Life Labs is routinely reporting phosphomycin on the ESVL and broadly resistant coliforms. Uh, VHA often doesn't report it, but if you phone, they'll give you the result. Um, and, um, and and I agree, uh, that's what it's licensed for, but it's being, there's lots of off-label mm -hmm. use. Yeah. Um, but that's usually us uh, getting sort of uh, creative and tr trying to treat patients who have more complex problems where ID isn't really an option. But it can be used, and you know I have prescribed it. You know every other day, dosing times, you know four doses and stuff like that to treat more complex problems. And I find it does fail sometimes. Uh, it's yeah. not uh, it's not a it's not a fantastic drug for treating prostatitis or pyelonephritis. I mean, phosphomycin in Europe, they have an intravenous. They have IV, yeah. They use it to give it IV to treat you know nosocomial pneumonia. I mean, it's, a, yeah. it's a, a good broad spectrum agent. It's just the way we're delivering it and the dose and stuff right now. Um, but uh, it does play a role the, uh, in, the, in the ESBL patients. You, you, yeah, you, definitely you, a big you role. Them out of the eMERGE because there's many ESBLs where that's the only oral agent that's going to work. Mm -hmm. it, are you doing the legal aspiration of the catheter? Uh, no, it's, so you swap it and then the, the, the first sample port on the side, you, you can draw it, right? So, oh, okay. Yeah. But it's just the whole thing is covered above this. Yeah, 24, 48 hours. Right. So, uh, there is no way. And what if, what if antibody PPD for phosphatidine, Cipro, Ceptra? Yeah, so Cipro, uh, Ceptra, and the tetracycline, and oxycycline, those have better penetration into the prostate tissue. I mean, sometimes you get stuck and you end up having to use a beta lactone if that's all you have, but there is less effect. It's one of those tissues in the body that's extreme target. For I'll just add that uh, um, I've been stuck a couple times, and um, the beta lactams are weaker. But I've reviewed the literature on this quite extensively. Cefuroxime has some of, has the best uh, uh, prostate penetration. But I think cefixime. And I just recently cured a guy with cefixime that had lots of problems. So it works. It's just you know you may have to go a bit longer to really. Yeah. So is uh, phosphamycin proper smell versus resistant? Proper I think most will be sensitive. Sensitive, yeah. yeah. Proteus is one of those indol ones, so the pro Proteus and Morganella, they can be quite resistant, some of those sometimes. So I think um, phosphomycin will be a drug you might have to go to in some of those. But it should be reported. Like, like I said, Life Labs will report it. The Hall will report it too, but you might have to phone them. Because mm -hmm. I'm in a very uh, elderly, and I do very low antibiotic because a lot of Proteus, uh, yeah, Mirabilis is actually quite sensitive most of the time. Okay. Great. Lots of learning. Thank you so much. <laughs>